Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me and see me. I'm sitting in my home in Berlin, Germany. And this is fine to receive this invitation for telling you about Gandhi and Osiecki, Hitler and the Nobel Peace Prize. There are so many reasons why it is urgent to speak about this complex because it is our common heritage, the heritage of nonviolent resistance. And um, we can add two more names. One name is Albert Einstein and one other name is Willy Brandt. Willy Brandt came from my hometown Lübeck near Hamburg in Germany. And Willy Brandt had been the fourth Nobel Peace Laureate from Germany after Karl von Ossietzky. You saw this video of the Nobel Peace Center on the occasion of a specific exhibition commemorating the courage and political pacifism of Karl von Ossietzky, who Einstein compared with Gandhi. And I would like to go back to the roots to find out what was the relation of Karl von Ossietzky to India. But let us first com commemorate on this 1st of August that there were two incidents, two events, which are linked to this date, 1st of August. One was the abolition of slavery through the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833. That was in the British Empire and the slave owners were compensated with 20 million pounds, 40% of the annual revenue and this Money was lent by bankers Nathan Mayer Rothschild and his uh, relative Moses Montefiore. So 1st August 1834, abolition of slavery. And we know that Mahatma Gandhi was fighting against semi-slavery. That means all the forms of slavery in disguise like the indentured labor system in South Africa. So this struggle for emancipation from slavery and social justice we can see in the actions of civil disobedience by Henry David Thoreau but also by the lifelong campaign of Count Leo Tolstoy in his plea for non-violent non-cooperation, non-violent non-cooperation and Gandhi's new concept based on Thoreau and Tolstoy and the fearlessness of Socrates Satyagraha in South Africa. There was a second event not just 
linked with the end of slavery in the British Empire, but also the beginning of the First World War, linked with Berlin, Germany. And there were some soldiers returning from war, giving a pledge, no more war. They organized manifestations in Berlin between 1920 and 1924. They wrote poems against the war. They recited them publicly. And among those, formed a peace federation of war participants were the journalist Karl von Osiecki and his friend the Jewish lawyer and anti-war poem writer Kurt Tucholsky and he in June 1919 wrote a poem you can literally translate war on war. They lay in the trenches for four long years. Time, a great time. They froze, were lives ridden, and still had at home a good wife and two little children far, far away. And no one to tell them the truth of the war. And no one who dared to stand up and protest, month after month, year after year. And then when one of them went on leave, at home he saw all the folks with fat bellies, and all around he saw spread like the plague, the dancing, the greed, the black market profits, and the horde of pan-German scribblers barks, war, war, victory, glow, a win in Albania, a win in Flanders, and the dying was done by the others, the others. They saw their pals stagger and fall, that was the fate of nearly them all wounds, animal pain, and then death, a small spot, dirty red, and they carried them out and covered them up. Who do you think will be next? And a cry from the millions went up to the stars. Will these people never learn? Is there something that makes this worthwhile? Who is it sitting up there on the throne, larded from top to bottom with medals, and whose only command is kill them, kill them, blood and ground up bounce and filth. Then all of a sudden the ships sprung a leak. The captain has bidden us fond farewell and was last seen swimming away. The soldiers in grey now don't know what to do. For whom was all this? Pro patria? Brothers, brothers, close the rings. Brothers, that must be the final time. If ours is a Carthaginian peace, the self-same fate will soon befall our sons and our grandsons, too. Shall they also sprinkle blood red again, the trenches and the fresh green grass? Brothers, let them know what's up. It must and cannot go on like this. Every one of us has seen where such madness needs must leak. The fire they fanned begins to burn. Put it out. The imperialists who make their nests with them over there are producing a brood of nationalists here. And in another 20 years, new cannons for sure will be on the way. That would not be peace. That would be mad. The same old dance on the same old volcano. Thou shalt not kill, someone did say. And humanity hears and humanity wails. Can it never be otherwise? Make war on war and peace on earth. So far, Kotoholsky's poem used the slogan of Frédéric Passy, Guerre contre la guerre, and Frédéric Passy from France was the first winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And this poem was recited all over in the center of Berlin in the first peace manifestation, anti-war manifestation on 1st of August 
1920, precisely 100 years ago, and we can now jointly celebrate. This was a no more war movement, a demonstration literally translated never again war. And as Kotoholsky predicted in this prophetic poem, 20 years later there will be, there would be a new, a second world war. Now I want to show you some relic of this second world war. It is the part of an incendiary bomb my family almost destroyed in Lübeck during a bombing, a flat bombing night. So this is a constant anti-war souvenir I received from my family. And it is by coincidence that I can speak to you. So who organized these great manifestations in 21, 1921, already more than 200,000 then, amongst them Albert Einstein and his wife distributing leaflets together with Karl von Osiecki, the journalist, and his wife, Maud from Maud of Osiecki. And uh, Maud von Osiecki, her story might be interesting. She was a British wife of Karl von Osiecki. Karl von Osiecki, in this book, Maud is describing her reminiscences. She herself was born in India, in Hyderabad. And this is a Anglo-Indian family, Hetty Palmer. Uh, then she was married with Noel Litchfield Woods and his mother died early. So daughter, daughter Maud von Osiecki, she came early to England. She was in Hyderabad living in the house of her grandfather was a banker who was close to the Quakers, the Society of Friends, who were usually non-violent and pacifist. And this banker was kind of competitor with the Nabob of Hyderabad. So Maud von Osiecki always spoke in her family about her Indian heritage. She herself became a nurse in Manchester. She wanted to be independent under the influence of Emmeline Pankhurst, the suffragette. And Maud von Osiecki participated in women's rights manifestations in the Hyde Park in London. Then she came to London and then to Manchester. She was a Manchurian nurse and went to Hamburg, taught language and card games. And she was quite Rich and she met Karl von Osiecki. They married before the First World War, 1930, the same year when Karl von Osiecki first was sentenced because he was criticizing the military courts and he referred explicitly to Leo Tolstoy and his play The Living Corpse. So Karl von Osiecki, before the First World War, was influenced tremendously influenced by the thought of Leo Tolstoy. Nevertheless, Karl von Osiecki and Kurt Tucholsky both became soldiers. They knew what war means firsthand. And after the war, they were not only happy about the fall of the feudal dynasty, the feudal dynasty, the uh, surrender of the Kaiser, but they were promoters of liberal democracy. 
they were critical minds. They were writing in favor of humanism and pacifism. And they organized the No More War demonstrations, which were also inspired by the Austrian anti-war writer Karl Kraus, who wrote about the First World War as the last days of mankind. And Karl Kraus gave his first lectures against the war in Berlin and then in Vienna. But also these demonstrations were influencing the No More War movement in England through Martha Steinitz and then Arthur Ponsonby and also in Austria and many other countries in Europe. So it was a European movement. And um, let's come back to the fact that Karl von Ossietzky received as a prisoner of Hitler the Nobel Peace Prize for his commitment. He was uh, praised and the Nobel Peace Center on their website have these uh, words written by um, the, a man who wrote a letter to the chairman of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. In times such as these, we must hold the flag high. Cowardice is treacherous. The award to Osjetsky confirms that we are brave enough to show our colors and we are met with respect. The Hitler regime has no respect for cowards, however, that has been amply brought to bear by Nazi policies. Because in the autumn 1936, the Norwegian Nobel Committee made a daring decision, choosing for the first time to award the Peace Prize to a person at odds with his own country's regime. Even before Hitler came to power in 1933, Osjetsky had been imprisoned for revealing how the German government had built up a secret air force with the help of the Soviets in direct violation of the peace treaty after World War I. Osjetsky was an uncompromising critic of political developments in Germany and was one of the first persons to be interned in a concentration camp by the Nazis. Tortured and abused, he developed a serious heart condition and tuberculosis. The Norwegian Nobel Committee praised Osjetsky as a defender of freedom of speech and for serving as a symbol of peace. The prize helped to rouse public opinion in the struggle against Nazism. Osjetsky directly responded to a Nazi leader, I am, have always been and will always be a pacifist. Pacifist is a word from the Latin, pacificus, meaning peacemaking, a person who under no circumstance condones the use of violence, a peace advocate. Pacifists have been key figures in the international peace movement. There was an international campaign for Osjetsky. His friends and colleagues worked to gain his release from captivity, of course. In 1935, they decided, in addition, to use the Nobel Peace Prize as a means of helping him. And over a two-year period, the Norwegian Nobel Committee received over 500 letters nominating the controversial prisoner. The Norwegian Nobel Institute was also inundated by letters of support, particularly from the labor movement. Socialist Willy Brandt, who had fled from Nazi Germany to Norway, was an important supporter of Osjetsky. He campaigned for the persecuted prisoner and took contact with the Norwegian Nobel Committee. Brandt himself received the Peace Prize in 1971. Among those who supported Osjetsky, there was also H.G. Wells and Aldous Huxley, Albert Einstein. Perhaps we 
come for such a moment to the 1971 Nobel Peace Laureate. Uh, actually, he was uh, he was praised for his support for Karl von Ossietzky and in his own in his own memorable Nobel lecture. Willy Brandt spoke that war is no longer the last resort, no longer, no longer the ultima ratio, but rather the ultima irratio, that means the maximum irrationality, irrationality. I say here, Brandt wrote, I say here what I say in Germany. A good German cannot be a nationalist. A good German knows that he cannot refuse a European calling. Through Europe, Germany returns to itself and to the constructive forces of its history. Our Europe, born of the experience of suffering and failure, is the imperative mission of reason. And then, in his lecture, Brandt refers to the Nobel Peace Laureates of Germany. European peace policy lives from the spirit of history. This does not exclude the darkest years, but explicitly includes them. The award of the Nobel Peace Prize to Karl von Ossietzky during that evil era of the Hitler regime meant a great deal. Together with Ludwig Quitter, he had been active in the German Peace Society. With his sharp pen, he struggled against militarism and nationalism. In 1921, he wrote, Many nations have fought against each other, but the blood that has flowed is of only one kind. The blood of Europe's citizens. That era demanded more from him than civil courage. It demanded his life. Shortly before the presentation was made, one of those in power tried to exact from this uneasy prisoner an assurance that he would refuse the prize. In return, he was to be set free, given financial security, and not to be bothered again in the future. Osetsky refused and went back to prison. At that time, Brandt was 20 years old and illegally in Berlin just then. He had been directly involved in the campaign, was deeply moved when later learned of his decision. In Karl von Osetsky, Brandt wrote, the Nobel Committee had honored a man who had been persecuted and who could not come here to receive the prize. That award was a moral victory over the ruling powers of barbarism. Today, then 1971, in the name of Free Germany, he wished to express belated thanks to the Nobel Committee for making that decision.
we wish to express belated thanks to the Nobel Committee for making that choice. At the same time, we wish to express this appreciation and encouragement to those who helped people imprisoned or persecuted in other ways on account of their convictions. So far, Willy Brandt, 1971. Willy Brandt, who was honored for his detente policy between East and West, who, whose gesture was uh, visible. It was the gesture falling down on his knees as a token of remorse for all those who were killed during the Jewish ghetto uprising in Warsaw in 1943. Let us go for one minute to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, it was him who had a very interesting expression of his appreciation for Gandhi and Karl von Ossietzky. Albert Einstein published Out of My Later Years writings in 1950 and he honored the same page, Mahatma Gandhi, 1939, and Karl von Ossietzky, 1946. About Gandhi, Albert Einstein wrote, a leader of his people, unsupported by any outward authority, a politician whose success rests not upon craft, nor the mastery of technical devices, but simply on the convicting on the convincing power of his personality. A victorious fighter who has always scorned the use of force. A man of wisdom and humility, armed with resolve and inflexible consistency, who has devoted all his strength to the uplifting of his people and the betterment of their lot. A man who has confronted the brutality of Europe with the dignity of the simple human being and thus at all times risen superior. Generations to come, it may be, will scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. On the same page, Einstein wrote on Karl von Ossietzky. Only one who spent the years following the First World War in Germany can fully understand how hard a battle it was that a man like Ossietzky had to fight. He knew that the tradition of his countrymen, bent on violence and war, had not lost its power. He knew how difficult, thankless and dangerous a task it was to preach sanity and justice to his countrymen, who had been hardened by a rough fate and the demoralizing influence of a long war. In their blindness, they repaid him in hatred, persecution and slow destruction. To heed him and to act accordingly would have meant their salvation and would have been a true relief for the whole world. It will be to the eternal fame of the Nobel Foundation that it bestowed its high honor on this humble martyr and that it is resolved to keep alive his memory and the memory of his work. It is also wholesome for mankind today since the fatal illusion against which he fought has not been removed by the outcome of the last war. The abstention from the solution of human problems by brute force is the task today as it was then. But Einstein had been in solidarity with Ossietzky long before, since the times of the No More War movement, 1921, we remember. And also when Ossietzky was imprisoned in 1932, he was writing a letter in favor of his release. But most of all, it was the statement in 1935 on 
27 of October from Princeton, when Einstein wrote to the Nobel Committee, Formally speaking, I have no right to propose a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize, but under the conditions now prevailing, my conscience dictates that I address to you this letter. In awarding this prize, the Nobel Committee has a unique opportunity to accomplish an act of great historical significance, an act whose repercussions would most likely contribute to a solution of the peace problem. This could be accomplished only by awarding the prize to a man who, by his actions and his agony, is more deserving of it than any other living person, Karl von Ossietzky. To award the Peace Prize to him would instill new life in the cause of pacifism in the very country which, because of the circumstances now prevailing there, constitutes the gravest threat to world peace. Moreover, such a gesture would arouse the conscience of all well-meaning people the world over and inspire them to work for the establishment of a secure international order. These were the words of Albert Einstein on October 27, 1935 from Princeton. And in his later years, Einstein always confirmed his belief that Gandhi gave solutions, paved the path out of the misery of cruelty and war. And in an interview, there is also an audio recording of this, in 1950, in June 18, uh, it was a documentary broadcast sponsored by the United Nations under the title The Pursuit of Peace. He answered to a last question. The question was to Mr. Einstein. United Nations Radio is broadcasting to all the corners of the earth in 27 languages. Since this is a moment of great danger, what word would you have us broadcast to the peoples of the world? And Professor Albert Einstein responded to this question, what word to the peoples of the world? He chose the following words. On the whole, I believe that Gandhi held the most enlightened views of all the political men in our time. We should strive to do things in his spirit, not to use violence in fighting for our cause and to refrain from taking part in anything we believe is evil. At this particular time, before I read the two last quotes from uh, Gandhi and from Ossietsky himself, I would like to refer to the fact that you find a very fine essay on the multinational campaign for Karl von Ostjewski, written by Erwin Abrams on the internet. It's a paper presented in 1991, and it is a very good summary in English language about this great international campaign in favor of the Nobel Peace Prize for the prisoner of Hitler, who then was in the concentration camp near the German-Dutch border and who was forced to labor in the, in the box, the peat box soldier, and who was a symbol of resilience, resistance against the German fascism. And Gandhi knew about Karl von Ossietzky. There was a, an article in the Statesman, Gandhi responded to, and this article referred explicitly to, on the one hand, the preacher, the pastor, uh, Martin Niemöller, a pacifist from the Lutheran Church, and also to Karl von Ossietzky explicitly. 
And you can find this in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi wrote an article about this particular and very interesting article in the Statesman. In January 2, 1939, it was published on 7th of January 1939. It was before the first, the Second World War, before. And Gandhi was responding to the notion might nonviolence not be ineffective. He responded following I do not think, this is what Gandhi wrote. I do not think that sufferings of Pastor Niemöller and others, that means Karl von Osiecki, have been in vain. No. They have preserved their self-respect intact. They have proved that their faith was equal to any suffering, that they have not proved sufficient for melting a Hitler's heart merely shows that it is made of a harder material than stone. But the hardest metal yields to sufficient heat. Even so must the hardest heart melt before sufficiency of the heat of nonviolence. And there is no limit to the capacity of nonviolence to generate heat. Every action is a resultant of a multitude of forces, even of a contrary nature. There is no waste of energy. So we learn in the books of mechanics. This is equally true of human actions. The difference is that in the one case we generally know the first forces at work, and when we do, we can mathematically foretell the resultant. In the case of human actions, they result from a concurrence of forces of most of which we have no knowledge. But our ignorance must not be made to serve the cause of disbelief in the power of these forces. Rather is our ignorance a cause for greater faith, and nonviolence being the mightiest force in the world and also the most elusive in its working, it demands the greatest exercise of faith. Even as we believe in God and faith, so have we to believe in nonviolence and faith. Hitler is but one man, enjoying no more than the average span of life. He would be a spent force if he had not the backing of his people. I do not despair of his responding to human suffering, even though caused by him. But I must refuse to believe that the Germans as a nation have no heart, or marked less, markedly less than the other nations of the earth. They will some day or other rebel against their own adored hero, if he does not wake up betimes. And when he or they do, we shall find that the sufferings of the pastor and the fellow, his fellow workers had not a little to do with the awakening. An armed conflict may bring disaster to German arms. It cannot change the German heart, even as the last defeat did not. It produced a Hitler vowed to wreak vengeance on the victors. And what a vengeance it is. My answer, therefore, must be the answer that Stevenson gave to his fellow workers who had despaired of ever filling the deep pit that made the first railway possible. He asked his co-workers of little faith to have more faith and go on filling the pit. It was not bottomless. It was it must be filled. It was not bottomless. It must be filled. Even so, I do not despair, because Herr Hitler's or the German heart has not yet melted. On the contrary, I plead for more suffering, and still more, till the melting has become visible to the naked eye. And even as the pastor has covered himself with glory, a single Jew, bravely standing up and refusing to bow to Hitler's decrees, will cover himself with glory and lead the way to the deliverance of the fellow Jews. And Gandhi goes on writing, I hold that nonviolence is not merely a personal virtue. 
It is also a social virtue to be cultivated like the other virtues. Surely society is largely regulated by the expression of nonviolence in its mutual dealings. What I ask for is an extension of nonviolence on a larger national and international scale. Though I cannot claim to be Christian in the sectarian sense, the example of Jesus' suffering is a factor in the composition of my undying faith in nonviolence, which rules all my actions, worldly and temporal. And I know that there are hundreds of Christians who believe likewise. Jesus lived and died in vain if he did not teach us to regulate the whole of life by the eternal law of love. Mahatma Gandhi in January 1939, referring to resistance against Hitler and Nazism in Germany. Let us go back to Karl von Ossietzky to finish this lecture. Let us go back to him. What, what did Ossietzky himself write? What did he write about the responsibility of a journalist? He said, I'm not going to prison out of reasons of loyalty, but because as a prisoner I shall be most embarrassing. I am not bowing my head to the majesty of the Reich court clothed in red satin. As the inmate of a Prussian jail, I shall be a living demonstration against a judgment handed down by a court of the highest instance, a judgment which appears to be politically tendentious and very shaky in law. I naturally do not deny the right of a publicist to take to flight, to escape arrest by the ruling order. This is the right of everyone innocently condemned. If the normal road to rehabilitation is barred, or if he has lost his trust in the objectivity of the judges. But in each individual case, it is a matter of doing that, of doing that which is most effective. This alone must be the decisive favor. An oppositionist who goes abroad soon finds no echo in his own country. An exclusively political publicist can, in the long run, not get along without close contact with the whole complex against which he fights and for which he fights. He becomes exalted, goes awry. He who wishes to fight effectively against the poisoned spirit of a country must share that country's general fate. And to end this lecture, I want to demonstrate the appreciation of Karl von Ossietzky towards Mahatma Gandhi when he wrote in the year 1929, Gandhi is no political human being in the European sense. He is more. He is the secret force without office and party, yet dominating everyone. He is a defender of the old and a guide to the unknown, at the same time teacher of wisdom and an elementary school headmaster, thinker and practitioner, dreamer, and organizer of American format, but in everything exemplary, whether he stood up for sanitary reforms or whether he fought the ancient prejudice against the pariahs, or whether he silently entered the British prison. India can be considered fortunate enough that her new law is not imposed on her by a dictator, does not boast in the relentless command of an Asian Napoleon, but is proclaimed by the gentle voice of Mahatma Gandhi. So, now we might understand why those who awarded to 
Karl von Ostiewski, the Nobel Peace Prize, knew exactly who they awarded this prize. And you can find their words of 1936 on the website of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. And it's quite interesting to at least have one last sentence of the chairman of the Nobel Committee speech, presentation speech. He was uh, thinking much about Ossietsky and he came to following conclusion. Ossietsky is not just a symbol, he is something quite different and something much more. He is a deed and he is a man. So now I would like to receive your questions in case you could properly listen to me and or see me, although there might have been some trouble with playing this video. So please, in case you have any question, you are free. Thank you very much for your encouragement and for your invitation, of course. By the way, may I ask you a question? Can you see me or can you only hear me? Yes. First of all, I want to refer to the fact that you find a Facebook group called Gandhi Information Center Research and Education for Nonviolence, and you are invited to join this group. Also invited to um, to see our uh, our website. Uh, which is uh, nonviolent resistance, nonviolent hyphen resistance dot info. And uh, I'm very happy that you can see me. I because I I I thought you you would have some had some problems because there was some signs indicating. But you can also find my personal website with essays for downloading on Tolstoy and Gandhi. So I gave, gave the information to you. And I would like to answer this question. This um, alternative models are quite interesting. You know that uh, Gandhi's concept was only comprehensive if you see Savodaya and Satyagraha in a context to gain economic and social independence, Swadeshi and Swaraj, political independence. So you have these four concepts and Savodaya is uh, rooted in the knowledge of, uh, of those who claimed equality like John Ruskin and also who highlighted and appreciated those 
doing bread labor like farmers and gardeners and so many more. And bread labor was the concept of Bondarev, a peasant writer, propagated by Leo Tolstoy. So we have, um, one can say, a cosmopolitan mutual uh, dialogue between and beyond civilizations. And this is all contributing to a world culture. Now, certainly this is the alternative, a world, a real world federation, but that should be grounded based on equality, equal rights, of course. But how to bring this about? How to uh, come down and uh, remove the hierarchies and privileges? This is, this is our, our constant struggle of, for emancipation. One answer is certainly it should be a world federation without visa, without passports. It should be a world citizenship. There should be no more military. The sh military should be banned. It's like a cancer producing fear and threat. It should be a universal new structure, an international system based on a reform. And of course, it can build upon the great achievements of the United Nations should be developed within the United Nations, perhaps, but at least there should be a new United Nations, like a World Federation. So we need a comprehensive reform. And inside our national societies, we need the eradication of all uh, f forms of uh, uh, hatred, prejudices and also uh, all forms of discrimination of social groups. Uh, this is very important. So it is highlighting individual and social rights according to the Universal Charter of Human Rights. And we need secular states, of course, but freedom of religion, on the other hand. We should derive wisdom from religion, but religions shall never be a tool of massacres, genocide, violence. On the contrary, they should criticize all kinds of personal and structural violence and cultural violence. So this is a liberal democracy with free speech of open critical minds. Is there any other question, perhaps? Maybe I can refer to a international manifesto against conscription and the military system, which we have launched since 1993, signed by the grandson of Leo Tolstoy, Count Serge Tolstoy, and also the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, Ila Gandhi. And we were so happy to receive the support also support of the great Sita virtuos Mastro Ravi Shankar and many others. Oh yes, yes. This is very interesting. There is a German text of Albert Einstein uh, referring to the manipulation of the uh, Nobel Prize awards. The decisions, the problematic decisions, right? Um, and I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very happy that I can present to you so many English language translations. But this particular criticisms came from Albert Einstein himself, who was very critical against the Nobel Committee and their decisions made to award the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, he was uh, so clear in his personal letter to a friend in Belgium. But I, I have a copy of this in, on this my desk here. But um, this text is only in the German original, which is a pity, of course. You find this document on the website of the International Institute of Social History. Uh, if you... Uh, 
it's IISG, and if you if you find uh, this document, you can download it and translate the German text. It's high time to do that into English. But this is a confirmation of your doubts. And of course, uh, on the other hand, you can say that the Nobel Committee was really courageous, not only when they at last, and one or two years too late, of course, the Nobel Peace Prize to Karl von Ossietzky, but also uh, there were rare decisions when the Nobel Committee also awarded the Peace Prize to, to dissidents in other countries. Uh, I remember Sakharov and um, Yuzhou Bo in China and so, and also Elie Wiesel, I remember the great uh, survivor of the con extermination camps, a uh, great Jewish writer, Elie Wiesel, um, when he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, I remember well, in his speech he referred to Karl von Ossietzky and the courage of the committee. So there are always uh, great signs of hope and there have been many remarkable uh, awards for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But it is quite remarkable that a uh, Nobel Peace Prize for Mahatma Gandhi has not been uh, decided. And also, it started very early when Leo Tolstoy was publicly nominated for the first Nobel Peace Prize he said he think they who serve the cause of peace best should receive this uh, this award and he referred to the spirit wrestlers the dukobors uh, who burned who had burned their weapons in 18, 1895 collective weapon burning and this was a a symbol for a new era without the military. And uh, Tolstoy was impressed and Gandhi explicitly referred to these Dukobors in his autobiography, uh, The Story of My Experiments with Truth. So the Dukobors were nominated by Tolstoy, but neither Tolstoy nor the Dukobors received the Nobel Peace Prize. And after this uh, dangerous prize in the best sense. This great uh, outrage, Hitler was preventing all Germans from receiving a Nobel Prize again after Karl von Ossietzky's award. And then there were so many reasons to uh, award those who were active, who were committed and persistent in their plea for nonviolent resistance. So Gandhi should have received this at latest in 1948, but he was, he was shot before he could be awarded the prize. So uh, in a way, it is a great tragedy, but there was Albert John Luthuli, inspired by John Dubo, was inspired by Gandhi. There was Ralph Banshee, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But Tolstoy and Gandhi never received the prize. That's effect. Uh, for the future, maybe um, we should uh, encourage those with a vision for a new uh, international world federation structure. I think this would be um, support, uh, support for all those humanists and pacifists, all those who, who try to, to bring about equality, equal rights and social justice and peace, and who are constantly working for the removal of untouchability, all kinds of untouchability, because the emancipation can only be brought about by the conscious, the self-confident pariah in a way has become a sociological term. So there is a necessity for all-out emancipation, not
to gain privileges, but for a, for a society on the basis of equality, social, human rights, and also social justice. Yes. First of all, that's uh, very nice, this question referring to the role of teachers, intellectuals. I would say that it's a very crucial role, an important role. Our Gandhi Information Center is a society for education. I have been uh, president since ni November 1993, and our last pro project uh, during the past uh, 12 years have been small exhibition units on the history of nonviolent resistance, of, of the concept of nonviolent resistance. So we created small exhibitions you find on our website in the internet, nonviolentresistance.info. You find these exhibitions in English language, you find them referring to John Ruskin, to Henry David Thoreau, Mark Magandhi to the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, Bread and Roses, and also to Aldous Huxley and uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer and his Ethics for the Reference of Life, the Reference for Life as a universal ethics. He was also so close to, uh, to Gandhi and Tagore. Einstein was uh, meeting Tagore in his summer house in Kaput. Tagore was, uh, uh, you know, the ambassador of India. And um, we also created a nice exhibition on Tagore, English language, you know, uh, referring to his poems, his paintings, and also his, his essays. And he, he was such an uh, inspiration and Tagore and Gandhi, they were uh, humanists, humanists, uh, they were the representatives of humanity uh, from India. And afterwards, we know so many more, Savrapali, Radhakrishna, and, and, uh, and that's the reason why we can say that the role of intellectuals and teachers is high because we need to sow some seeds of enlightenment, that means uh, show these exhibitions, you know. You can also create virtual museums, of course, digital museums, but it's, it's also very impressive if you have a small gallery and show these exhibitions and then have some talks and a round, you know, round table talks so that um, that you can have a free association, also a volunteer, volunteer, voluntary approach to education for adults. And, and like in, in the, the anti-war museum, we showed these exhibitions in a particular anti-war museum, also inspired by Tolstoy and one of the great artists who supported the No More War movement, Ernst Friedrich. That is exactly what we can do as teachers to create small exhibitions and also uh, to, to choose some excerpts which bring some, shed some new light on this cosmopolitan world culture. There are, there are of course, questions I, I cannot answer now. I confess. So, in in case you um, you refer to uh, weaknesses, failure, and weaknesses of Gandhi, there's certainly or there will be certainly much more time. And also, uh, you know, first of all, it is always important to highlight the fact that Gandhi, on his own. Uh, was great, but there were so many supporters, there were so many um, people who even lost their lives in his nonviolent resistance movement, who were organizers, 
and all those shall be highlighted. There were also forerunners, also in his own country, you know, Fule, for example, you find a museum in Pune, and you have people who were also called Mahatma in India, as we know. They were for the removal of untouchability. They were for the emancipation of the poor and the weak. So they should be highlighted. It is more important to highlight these um, almost unknown great thinkers, not just Ambedkar, but also others, and who were on those who are active now, of course, who are now active for ecology, for uh, for ecology, um, you know, in this time of climate change, in this time of the global pandemic. Those who are doing social work are um, appreciated well, but they shall be always appreciated. They are doing, they are doing this uh, work which you call charity, you, you, you can also call it uh, mutual aid. And that's the reason why our center recommended also two symbolic new international days for the United Nation. One referring to Tolstoy's birthday, uh, an international day of compassion and empathy. And also one referring to the 15th of January, the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In the United Nations International Day of, of Mutual Aid and Solidarity. I've been to Gujarat and I was, it was 1985, and I know uh, that there was. A, Many, there was many problems then, even then. Um, it is, it is uh, emancipation necessary and it cannot be imposed, but it is important to bring it about. And this is only necessary if those in society think about the roads uh, from a new point of view. And as Gandhi identified, with untouchables and try to do all the works untouchables do. Uh, this, this shall uh, be the guideline for the future. And uh, this will also diminish the influence of populists in society. I think this is urgent. We can learn, um, be inspired by your great museum's commemoration sites on Gandhi and there are even virtual tours. You can also go via internet, see the virtual tour, at least many of these um, parts of the museums you can see from the inside via internet. This is so inspiring, I tell you. I would like to visit India again, see Pune and, and other cities and uh, Ahmedabad again, and Twarda and um, Porbanda. Yes, I, uh, I can refer uh, to the fact that I have, I have, we have published my, my lecture in Bengaluru a few weeks ago on our internet. And I can give you the link and then you can read about this because it's so right what you uh, refer to if you mention celibacy, because uh, this is quite interesting. I want to uh, I want to give you the link where you can read the context. You can read what uh, Tolstoy, Schweitzer, and Gandhi uh, why they appreciate this concept of renunciation. It is. Um, it is a keynote address, and I copy the link and give it to you now, here, in the chat. So um, <clears throat> here you can uh, download this PDF file, and this is uh, this is certainly of great, you know, of great importance. You see this uh, respect, this respect, this gentle gentleness, this. Uh, 
being together with respect for the dignity of the other. The human dignity is in the core of all this, not just the right to life, which the Nazis denied, the right to life and um, physical inviolability, which is not just a concern of women's rights, but also, uh, and you know how important this is uh, to realize the commandment not to kill. But, but also you have this, um, this basic idea of conscious non-acting, like the Wu Wei principle of Lao Tzu, the soft water which breaks the stone, the non-acting, Tolstoy referred to this, Martin Buber referred to this. And um, you can see that this uh, gospel of renunciation, uh, like Mahadev Desai, Gandhi's secretary, called it, and Gandhi himself expounded it, this renunciation refers not only to vegetarianism or veganism or uh, uh, sexual abstinence, but it is also related to drinks, drugs, and gambling. And, and it was Tolstoy who, who first wrote against uh, drinks, drugs, and gambling, against alcohol, uh, narcotics, and um, gambling in his essay, Why Do Men Stupefy Themselves? So you have a, a very, uh, very broad social reform, which is uh, um, inseparably linked with self-transformation. So it's a, it's a social reform on the basis of, uh, we would say, character building, but this cannot be imposed from outside. It is a formation of your own character. It's a, it's, it cannot be forced, you know. It's, it's not the conditioning system. It is a, it's a kind of seeing the light of within, you know, this, um, listening to your s small, still voice. This is the voice of conscience. So this is a sometimes long and also painful a process of self-transformation and it is inseparably linked with social reforms. So I, I will be very happy to continue our dialogues one day. Um, perhaps when we might have the chance to meet again without any risk for our good health in future. And I, I would like to encourage you to go on uh, serving the course of life and human rights and also contribute to the survival of our species. All the best for you. Jai Jagat.